So, uh, Raymond, how are you today? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Can't complain. That's good. That's good. Um, okay. How did you come up with the title of, of your production company? Um, yeah, actually, well, I mean, that title came about a long time ago because uh, I'm also a musician and I used to do that more semi-professionally. Uh, over COVID, I kind of took a little bit of a turn and started exploring some other art forms. Uh, but the name Satan's Love Box was something I came up with years ago. And the uh, initial idea for it was to use it for like a studio. Uh, I had this dream in my head of opening a studio and being able to uh, record bands there and all this stuff. And I thought that cool. would be a cool name for that. And then it never ended up happening. So then when myself and my uh, my uh, creative partner, Artie, had this idea of starting to try and make some films together and write some stories um, we basically ran into the point where we needed a name for the production company. And I was like, oh yeah, well, this thing has been sitting there in my head for a while and I like it. Um, but the thought process behind the name was almost kind of like trying to juxtapose something that is, uh, you know, fundamentally, you know, I don't want to say bad or evil or whatever, but, you know, Satan has certain uh, connotations to it. Um, sure. But I didn't want it to come across as too try hardy or too, um, you know, uh, too aggressive. So to mm -hmm. put, you know, something about love on the other side of it, I just thought was a nice balance. Um, one of the the actual inspirations uh, aesthetically for that title would be the film Suspiria, uh, the Dario Argento film, because I think that's just the perfect balance of that. I think that film kind of really balances the that kind of really uh, kind of beautiful feminine energy and the the, the ballerinas and and the the just the kind of tone of that film but then there's some like really brutal violence in the in the in the technicolor kind of blood and the beautiful like color palettes and all the shots so it's just like i just love that balance in horror in general if you can balance yeah. making something beautiful but also grotesque yeah yeah no I, I i get that i get that and and why not have a little bit of uh fun with with what you're doing you know in the creative process and and everything else um yeah yeah so yeah, you said that you uh, you came from a sort of music uh, background, or you w were interested in music, and wanted to do music. Um, I myself uh, love you know the two things I really love is music and and film. Um, but I I come across you fr uh, found out about you from um, your short film The Collected, which we, we can talk about. Um, but again, it's it's how how did you decide that hey i'm going to make a short film because one's not always um the same as the the other you know i mean that they do cross over a lot but uh, you know it, making a, a short film is is difficult you know there's lots of problems lots of problems to overcome there's big teams of people in compared to say making music it's for sure yeah you know, different um how did how did you decide that okay no this is what we're going to do for this um, project i mean i've always been uh i mean like yourself i've always really been into music and also films i've always been a horror horror movie guy as long as i can remember i've always loved that stuff um and you know the the thought actually even when i was in high school years ago i had we me and I, me and a couple friends did make a short film we made like a really you know kind of shitty zombie film that never got finished or whatever but there was a couple really fun nights that we had you know filming with with a crew together and i kind of got a little bit of a taste of it um, and then there was a couple other times after that, that the idea came into my head of maybe let's just try to make a film, but then I never, I always would talk myself out of it essentially because of things like you just said, the fact that, you know, you, 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 you kind of instinctively start to think, oh, well, you know, I can't make a, mo a movie, you know what I mean? I don't have any experience. I mean, you need a team, you need money, you need all these different mm -hmm. things. Um, and to a certain degree that is true. Uh, depending on the scale of the film that you're trying to make. But then at the same time, you know, people have made films on iPhones and, and things like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. people have gone with really modest uh, budgets or technology or small teams. And it's just a matter of like the idea being really good um, mm -hmm. or the story being really good. I mean, Blair Witch Project is another one of my favorites that I think uh, demonstrates that really well. I mean, it was made uh, on a pretty modest budget and that's the kind of movie that when you watch the Blair Witch Project, you're like, well, I could, I could make this. You know what I mean? It's literally just mm -hmm. like a camcorder in, in the woods. Uh, you don't see much of anything. Uh, everything's implied. You just have a couple good performances and some good you know, world building 
uh, and and kind of some good build up. But you you don't I mean you don't even see the witch in the film for Christ's sake. There's literally yeah. it's all it's all atmosphere in that film and and stuff like that was what kind of inspired me to be like well you know what maybe we can do this if we just think in terms of like what we can do uh, rather than thinking in terms of you know this is going to be impossible but just thinking about uh, you know because over my years of playing music and stuff I, I have met a lot of different people that have different skills um you know doing music videos uh things like that i know some good like the, the cinematographer who shot the collected uh we met through doing a music video and uh the the other artist sean who's kind of the balloon technician uh on that film who did all those balloon effects uh he's you know he's a really legit world traveled artist who does that stuff uh you know balloon art and structures and all this crazy stuff um, and he was one of the inspirations for the film because I kind of thought, okay, well, if we have no money and we have very little resources, what do we have? Or who do I know that we could maybe utilize that has a very specific esoteric kind of skill set that we could build a story around or some kind of thing around? So, I mean, I've always liked clowns. I mean, I think clowns are an, clowns are like very um, cliche, I, I would almost say in a certain sense, especially with sure. films like the like the Joker and, and it that, that have come out recently and, and, and yeah. um, things like that, you know, the clown has always been in the cultural zeitgeist. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's, that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, uh, using a clown for storytelling is necessarily expired either. Um, yeah, because I think, absolutely. you know, yeah, the archetype of the clown obviously goes, you know, far back to the jester and middle, middle ages and stuff like that. And like mm -hmm. in, in, in a modern context, it's been, turned into um something entirely different because of uh you know things like john wayne gacy or stephen king writing it and uh different things like that that have come up over the years that have changed the perception of clowns to being creepy but it's just like and i mean that's almost just like a common knowledge thing like people find clowns creepy for whatever reason i've never been one of those people i think they're kind of just cool and interesting but a lot of people sure. it's like just one of those things that gets under people's skin so i almost wanted to exploit that a little bit um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, the idea of a clan, and then when I thought of, uh, Sean with these balloon skills, it was kind of like, oh, well, this would be a great combination to use his abilities and kind of work a clown into it. Um, and it's something that we could do with very minimal, uh, budget. I mean, that, that's, that's literally the art of independent <clears throat> filmmaking, um, particularly with shorts. It's like, well, who do you know? where where have you access to what could you use let's make a film out of that so as i said you yeah. knew someone that could do that yeah if if i was going right i've got this idea for a, a, a clown film we get into the film in a, in a sec for anyone that hasn't seen it and everyone needs to see it because it's really really good um yeah if i wanted <clears throat> if i wanted to make this film then i'd be like oh well, i have to employ someone who's can make really cool sort of balloon kind of uh characters and things um, then that would cost money because I don't know so much. But the fact that you you had that person is like, well, that's what you use, isn't it? You use what is in your town, in your street, in your family, friends, all that sort of stuff. I mean, the, one of the, one of the things I liked about uh, the film, The Collected, so much what made me want to contact you was because around about the time I was watching lots of um, short horror films because I was tr trying to get um, a series of films. Uh, leading up to Halloween of, of this year, 2021, um, yeah. on, on the site. <clears throat> so I was trying to look for sort of really cool, um, I don't know about scary, because I I don't often find films particularly scary. You know, I, I like horror films and all that sort of stuff. But, um, and it's I think it's really, really difficult to actually find something that's that's either scary or creepy or, or, or unsettling. A, a lot of short films, are quite formulaic you know but but this one really really thought right this is really there's something to to what you made that was creepy that was unsettling and is um you know I, i've watched it uh several times because i just like okay i need to watch it again because it's not like as i said tons of zombie films or it's not like um someone's lost in the woods and there's some noises it's you know, from, from what you got um, and put together, there, there is something really kind of, you're watching it, but you're like, this is really makes me, I'm not sure how it makes me feel, you know? Um, 
so, so it's very, it's 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 a very very uh, interesting film. I mean, I mean, how long did it take to to make that, and what was your sort of approximate sort of budget? Did you have any budget, or literally was it just? Yeah, there was a little, there was a bit of budget, probably uh, maybe a couple grand uh, at the end of the day, all things told, wow. maybe a little more with post-production and, and coloring and things like that. We yeah. spent a little bit of money, but at the end of the day, it, it, it wasn't much. I mean, most of the people that worked on the film for us, like, uh, like I mentioned, the balloon artist, the cinematographer, uh, my two buddies that scored it. Um, they basically all worked for nothing, like, you know, pennies, essentially just being good sure. people and, and, and believing in the, in the project. And, really adding a lot to it i mean it would have this project would have been nothing without all those people like each yeah. person contributed such a huge thing to it i mean i thought the the music added a lot uh yeah. especially in the, in the last the last scene the music uh really punctuates the ending uh because there was a certain there was there was certain conceptual things with the ending that i wanted to have in there that didn't make it in there because of uh lack of resources let's call it and at first I was feeling discouraged almost when I was looking at the footage and I started to put the edit, the raw edit together. And I was kind of going, I don't know if this works. You know what I mean? I don't know if the climax really hits. Um, but then as soon as the music was added to it, I was like, oh, wow, it really tied it all together. Uh, yeah. Music can, can really go a long way with, with horror films. I mean, with films in general, with theater, with drama, music is so mm. inseparable to that. But especially in horror, I find I've always loved horror music, horror scores, uh, because you can, it's almost one of the most free, freeing types of scores because you can be dissonant and you can add weird sounds and it's all about creating that kind of atmosphere almost above being musical. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like creating that kind of atmosphere with music, I think is really powerful. Uh, but yeah, no, we shot this all basically in one really long uh, day. Uh, it was initially going to be two days, um, but because we were working with a young kid who yeah. uh had never had never acted before he was he's the so our the makeup artist who worked on the film and did the uh the clown makeup uh and played the mother as well in on, at the park uh that was her son evan okay um and he you know did a great job actually considering the fact that he'd never acted before and uh sure. you know he just basically showed up and we started bossing him around telling him what to do and he would do it and then he'd get bored and forget what he was doing and then we'd kind of circle him back into it and then he'd be uh eager again and there was that kind of cycle happened a few times throughout the day but ended up uh getting pretty much everything that we we wanted out of it and it was quite an experience in uh or an exercise in patience uh trying to you know work with a young kid in general i think would probably be difficult for directors but especially you know one that doesn't have much experience acting um, made it even more challenging, but I thought he did a great job and it was definitely essential to have the child be that young, I think, yeah. um, because it, you know, the whole thing about the, the idea of the, the kid and the clown and the relationship he has to the clown. Cause I mean, the first time the kid in real life saw the clown, um, he was actually kind of like afraid of the clown and he kind of freaked out a little bit and he didn't want to sure. go near the clown. And he was, he actually started crying um mm -hmm. and then you know a couple of people on set were like oh this is perfect this is perfect like you know capture this capture this because it's a real you know genuine emotion this kid is showing and you couldn't get him to do that if you tried yeah. but then the whole thing was that 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 to me was the opposite of how we needed the kid to respond because if he was afraid of the clown he would never right it was just like the whole thing is that he goes with the clown willingly and he yeah. walks away with the clown and so he has to if anything be amused by this clown or entertained by him or in, intrigued sure. enough by him uh, to leave his parents or whatever. So if he's afraid of the clown, he wouldn't have wanted to do to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we ended up getting it done in in, a, in one very long day. Um, and yeah, no, I appreciate what you're saying about the the balance or the emotions that you felt watching it because I definitely know what you mean. Like uh, as somebody who's grown up on horror films, I mean, I, I consider myself fairly desensitized. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it is certainly hard to feel scared. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different things that a horror movie can make you feel and not necessarily yeah. be, being scared isn't necessarily always the point uh, you know and I, I can appreciate you know gross out stuff or things that are super gory or shock have shock value uh, I mean I love some stuff like that mm -hmm. um, but to me yeah I really I'm really interested in trying to fit more into the kind of cerebral atmospheric borderline surreal fantasy cosmic-esque uh, end of horror 
And I mean, within this, you know, very small little idea, um, kind of, I think part of maybe what you're saying, because you said you're not sure how to feel um, be, because of it at the end of it. It's not, you almost left with a little bit of a question mark. You're like, well, what, what exactly happened or how do I, how should I feel? Is this a good thing that just happened or a bad thing? Because on the surface of it, it, it obviously appears like, um, you know, a child abduction, you know, I mean, this, this guy in a, in a, in, in makeup just took this child away from his parents and took him into a basement, you know what I mean? Which is, you know, a grown man taking a strange boy into his basement has a lot of uh, negative connotations to it. And, and, and on the surface, you're like, well, this is bad. You know, when, what did he do to the kid? Did he kill him? Where did the actual kid go? You mm -hmm. don't really know. But then the philosophy that like we had in our minds um, behind the clown, at least is more of like a preservationist uh, of, of, of things that are pure and innocent. Uh, rather than you know a, a, a child thief or or, an, or a killer or anything like that like I mean he never harms the child he never even touches the child um, and if anything it's like to a clown whose you know business is to amuse people and amuse let's say kids <clears throat> I mean well hold on a clown's business is to amuse people but it's like you're you're much more likely to get a reaction out of a child as a clown because most of sure. us are too most of us you know we're, we're we, we grow out of such a simple pleasure like a clown doing a magic trick or uh you know performing some slapstick kind of performance thing like that to us is almost very it's like dated uh we're we're just over that there's so many other more stimulating things that can entertain us than something yeah. like a clown so it's just like we don't really we're not entertained by that anymore and so from the cl clown's perspective it's like we're dead already you know what i mean like we're we don't we don't have that ability to be entertained by something so simple as a clown or or his own his own skills anymore a child on the other hand does which is why you know the the, the child is intrigued by the, the clown and he goes over to him and he's uh, amused enough by this little gift that he's given by the clown to walk away with him. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like the, the child is in his most pure and innocent form and the clown is trying to basically preserve him in that state. Um, because you know who who wouldn't want to who who doesn't romanticize the child you know inside of us or whatever that that mm -hmm. that child that dies when we get older or we consider the child to be you know the creative part of us like when you know when we say people have gotten old and they've lost the child in themselves it usually means that they're like done with life or whatever they're not yeah. you know, they're not they're not curious anymore yeah there's, there's no creative. magic in, left in them and all that yeah yeah totally yeah yeah and I I also again the first time I saw it I was like. I, lo I love the fact, again, I don't want to give too much away if anyone hasn't seen the film because they absolutely need to see it. And I will put the link in this and it's on the <clears throat> my, my website, Film Dimension, it's on YouTube as well. Um, the, the, the bit near the beginning where the, the, both the parents of the child are there in the park, but they're looking at the phone and they're not they're not paying any attention. I just thought that, 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 that's brilliant. You know, again, it, it's, you, could, you could tell that you were actually thinking about uh, what you were doing. You know, it wasn't just like, right, this bit's going to be scary, and then this happens, and this happens, and another scary bit. And it's like you were actually trying to do something that, yeah, had had sort of creative um, purpose. You know, um, and yeah, I just, I just the fact that they're just looking at the phone, they don't know what's going on with their their, their child in the park and this scary clown. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, I didn't it worked I didn't... really well. I didn't want to like, I didn't, that's the thing. I didn't want to slap. I didn't want to like slap, uh, you know, us or the audience or, or people in the face with that, like, uh, oh, well, let's look away from our phones or whatever. Cause everybody knows that every single person sure. knows that we, we all spend too much time on our phones. You, all you got to do is walk outside, stand at a bus stop anywhere, literally anywhere you go. And that's what people are doing. People walk with their, mm -hmm. I am guilty of it. I'm guilty of walking and, and, and being on my phone. Yeah. And it's just crazy. It's crazy how much everybody does that. And so I wanted to, in, to include that in a subtle way, you know what I mean, which is kind of having the parents be so detached to what's going on around them. It almost feels dreamlike uh, to me, yeah. you know what I mean? Because it's just like in a certain sense, it's like, well, you know, shouldn't these parents have heard what was going on beside them or whatever? But it's I, I almost think in terms of like a Lynchian kind of style, David Lynch kind of style of storytelling yeah. where it's like you know, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like reality doesn't matter anymore. It's more so about mm -hmm. just creating a mood. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I totally get it. I mean, <clears throat> it's interesting to go off on a slight tangent now. 
what's your opinion on um, media, social media, our phones and everything else, being able to watch lots of stuff so easily? Does that affect people's ability or desire to watch films? You know, you're making a, a short film, but we have a feature film three hours long or a five minute film. Um, is the impact of films, is it harder to get people's attention now because there's just so much constant, constant stuff streaming 24 hours a day and you can get it on so many different devices from a filmmaker's point of view? I mean, probably, yeah. I mean, I think that it's almost a double-edged sword, uh, the kind of way that technology is, has advanced because there's certainly an overstimulation uh, uh, an oversaturation of content um, and an abundance of, of content that's out there, be it Netflix or streaming or all the different ways that you can uh, consume media, whether it's music, Spotify, all these things. It's just like, there is just so much out there now and everything that's ever been made is still out there as well. Like, I mean, I still go and watch a film from the seventies I never saw or whatever. I mean, or music, sure. there's only, there's so much in the past. <clears throat> there's so much being made. And I think that sheer amount of it and the accessibility to all of it is makes it, it makes it harder to appreciate one individual thing. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like to watch a film, you know, 20, 30 years ago used to be more of an event uh, rather than something that people just do now. Like you can watch two, three movies in a night, not even really think about it. Or, or people yeah. will sit down and bin binge watch an entire season of a TV show and they'll be like, okay, cool. You know, where's the next season? And it's like, mm -hmm. man, that thing took like six, four, two, three, four, five, six months of, pe of, of hundreds of people's time to yeah. produce that. And then you just basically uh, swallowed it all up in, in, a hand, in a matter of hours and you're ready for the next thing already. So I think that there's yeah, a degree yeah. of, I think there's a degree of oversaturation and, and overstimulation. But at the same time, I think that having this kind of accessibility is, is also good because it allows you to um, investigate and explore different art forms that you wouldn't have, have known about or just like certain artists or genres or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. Like I've found so many movies uh, and, and albums and whatnot, artists that I would never have otherwise found or it would have been really hard to find their content. Um, whereas now it's just a matter of streaming it or, or, or finding it on YouTube or whatever it is. So it's like, you can really, uh, you know, become well adversed in, in, in art and culture and, and all these things um, because of the accessibility of it. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that there's, it's really a double-edged sword, I find. I think that there's both pros and cons to it. But I think as from the, from the perspective of creators and, and filmmakers and artists, it's certainly, a little bit of an uphill battle if you intend to uh you know get seen or you and you mm -hmm. you want to try to promote your thing or you want to try to god forbid make money off of it uh yeah. things like that yeah. become extra difficult nowadays i think because of that you really need to um have a, a really strong plan and you need to stand out uh in order to create any sort of traction and be consistent so i think mm -hmm. that's kind of yeah i think that's certain certainly a thing that uh, creators have to struggle with now more than anything. I think it's never been easy for creators or artists or filmmakers to get to that point, but I think it's become in a certain sense more difficult. Um, but then it's also easier because you have more tech available. Like, again, it, it applies really to music and to film. Um, you know, in the seventies, if you wanted to make a movie or you wanted to record an album, like you were looking at some pretty expensive gear and, and, and technicians yeah. to use that gear and you know using film itself was expensive sure. all that stuff really cost money whereas you know we we're just talking about making a film on an iphone like you know that that really in inhibits a lot of creativity for you because you can just do it or you know with music now everybody's just got you know pro tools or logic or whatever they have a little studio at home and you can like record music you can record albums so it's like there's a, there's also that and, and you know things like YouTube and and where you can release your your mm. content without needing distribution or without needing a, a label or anything like that you can just start doing it uh, at, which at the end of the day is is where I've always kind of come from it's like I don't really want to wait for official uh, validation or something like that I mean I would yeah. love to have I would love to have you know, this film, the collected or any film or anything I've done appear in uh, some festivals, like uh, short film festivals, horror festivals. Um, but at the same time, I didn't really want to play the game of waiting uh, to be accepted mm -hmm. into festivals before <laughs> releasing. It. 
because I know I think that's I think that's a trap that filmmakers get themselves into with with projects, especially if you've spent a lot of money and resources on it and you have this thing mm-hmm. now and you're kind of like, OK, well, how do we release this? And it just makes sense that you want to have it in festivals and you want to have this kind of thing around it. But it's like a lot of, you know, the more, quote, legit festivals, they won't touch you if you've already released your film. If you've already yeah. put it out on your YouTube channel, it's it's old news already to them. So it's yes, like, you know, absolutely. you have yeah, so I find I've known I've known filmmakers personally that have done that. They've had a project finished for, you know, almost a year or whatever that they're just sitting on because they're waiting for some kind of official release. And it's like, I don't really necessarily want to get into that game. I'd rather just do it and just create stuff. And, and if something happens, it's going to happen because I think that just hinders your creativity if you do too much of that. I think it's good to get something out. I mean, in the process of editing The Collected, I was already pretty much I'm it was only the second film that I've made that we've made and so it really was a just a learning experience at the end of the day for all of Mm us uh and by the end of it I was already like thinking about the next project you know what I mean I didn't want to think too I'm I'm glad we got it out for this this Halloween because that was like kind of we kind of did a bit of a push to get it out for Halloween because if we didn't I didn't want to do it around Christmas I was probably going to wait till next year or whatever but it was like the fact that we got it out uh on time was nice because now we can just start trying to develop the next project and you know just keep the mm-hmm. the creativity flowing so that's yeah, basically I, where we're at a, a, absolutely and i think i think it's interesting isn't it again partly why i started doing trying to do the film dimension and um wanting to sort of build a platform for people like yourself independent filmmakers and wanting to add content on the site that can just be seen by as many people as possible, not many at the moment, but hopefully it will expand and grow and everything else. But because, you know, I, I've worked on a small film, short film uh, a few years ago, and we went through the film festival um, route and all that, and I've met lots of other people who've done the same sort of thing, you know, spent a lot of money, a lot of time, make their short film, and yeah, they, they get sucked into or believe because everyone else does it that yeah you've got to submit it to these these film festivals and don't put it online anywhere because they won't touch you and all that sort of stuff and even the ones that get in at lots of money like cost at submitting to film festivals at the end of it after the weekend that they've had the film festival and being online now with covid and everything else but it's like if they were honest I'm not sure they would uh, say that it was worth it, that they had really got anything from it, you know, that no one had phoned them up and gone, hey, I've seen your short film. That's really, really good. Here's a million pounds. You want to make a feature? You know, <laughs> yeah. like, I, I don't know anyone who's had that conversation. You know, even people that won, won things, best picture, best horror, best whatever. Um, as far as I'm aware, unless they're having different conversations and not telling me, um, yeah, no one's knocking on their door going, oh, well, 100,000 people have just seen your film over the weekend because it was on on our website because we're a prestigious film festival. It's just like, it's still kind of, it's just there. And you kind of wonder, well, if you just put it on your own page, your your own social media and promoted it, then it would probably be seen as many, <laughs> any, many times, but you'd have more money in your pocket, you know? And I, I, I kind of think that that whole thing is from a, an age that maybe has kind of gone. Yeah, I mean, I think it's almost the equivalent of that, uh, you know, that dream that musicians have, that you're going to play that one show and there's going to be that guy in yeah. the back that happened to hear you and go, whoa, that, you know, you guys are amazing. I, you know, the, the, the record deal is going to land in your lap from God or whatever. Uh, yeah. And yeah, with the filmmakers, it's the same thing. Someone's going to see your, your film at the festival and they're going to, you know, notice your auteur uh, potential and they're going to want to send you a budget to, for your next film and all that. It's like, I don't, I don't doubt that's happened before. I'm sure it does happen still. Uh, but at the end of the day, most of the time, it's probably more like what you said. And it's just like, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, sure. Getting your, your, your film seen at a festival and, and getting eyes on it and all that is, is probably nice and I'm sure it feels good and I'm sure it adds legitimacy to the project to be able to have that little banner on your poster that has film mm-hmm. festivals on it little things like that stupid things like that go a long way with legitimizing your your projects mm-hmm. um but at the end of the day it's just like yeah I think 
uh, it's more important to just stay true to the, to the creative process and stuff like that. I mean, I, I can't speak from experience of having sunk thousands and thousands of dollars and, and months of my time into a project. I might feel a little bit differently about just dropping it online. I might want to have a little bit more of a, a campaign involved, uh, something sure. like a graph, a grassroots. I, I like the idea of doing something grassroots, um, or, or, you know, like we were, we were, we were actually, we didn't end up doing it, but we were thinking of, uh, doing something for this film with putting little balloons around the city attached to a little treasure box that has a co or a, a link that brings you to the film and has a little poem on it, uh, which we still might do. I mean, I, I, the fact that it's out already, I don't think makes it void or whatever. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that, that would be very, very cool. And again, it's, it's that sort of thing that does separate you from the whatever thousand other short films that are coming out that month you know and hope, hopefully yeah. it would do that be, anyway because it's a different film and it'd be better or whatever but you're right it's it's that kind of thing almost like you have to and some people some purists might kind of go oh but that's just playing games and like the content should speak for itself which of course it should but as we sort of said you're in a very crowded uh marketplace so yeah that sort of thing is is maybe maybe is what you need to do and sound, sounds like it'd be quite fun you know it could be quite funny uh, yeah yeah i've always that. liked that i've always liked the idea of stuff like that like uh, like you know street kind of guerrilla promotion stuff yeah. like i mean even at the end of the day it's just like if we did 20 or 30 or 40 of them at best let's say i don't know half actually took the card and went to the website and watched the film as a result mm -hmm. of it it's a measly 20 people or views or whatever you want to call it but to me that's a win that's a <clears> huge win just kind of like yeah 20 people is 20 people and, and to find it in that way i think would be cool to stumble across it in a in a you know physical analog way in the real world rather than it just coming up as a suggested link on youtube or something yeah exactly or, or, or you would have possibly like a real um venue a real theater a real somewhere where you're showing that film tomorrow friday night at eight o'clock whatever and yeah you you do these things that would be cool. Week. Yeah, for that, that would be a great idea for that, for like a showing at a little theater or something like that. Yeah, totally. Because because you're right, because you, you get that card and you hopefully you keep hold of that card. But the next video up on YouTube or on Vimeo or whatever, it's not the same. You, you can't you can't hold on to it. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's forgotten super quick, isn't it? Um, and that's kind of the problem with, with social media. But um yeah, it's, yeah, I, I, I think it would be a quite a cool idea, and I think probably more filmmakers could do the similar sort of thing. You know, um, what what do you have planned for the future? Do you, do you have other projects that you're wanting to sort of start on, maybe next year, or you're in process? Yeah, of? yeah, next year for sure. So on our uh, website, Satan's Love Box, we have um, a section for short stories. Uh, yeah. Some, some are written from myself, some are uh, my creative partner Artemis, uh, also writing his own. And so we have a lot of ideas, a lot of different ideas. I mean, the, the initial reason that we started writing these short stories was basically because we were trying to think of ideas for films but most of them ended up being too high scale or, you know, like right away, yeah. like if one of them's like, oh, you're, you're, you're lost in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the winter. And I'm thinking, okay, cool, how do we film that? like right away it's just like that that yeah. sounds difficult to film already cool idea uh yeah. but it's like realistically i mean we're looking at a crew out in the middle of winter we're like, like you know all that so it's like there's a lot of ideas that we have that were probably unrealistic to film so we just decided mm -hmm. to start writing them which obviously it's an entirely different skill set but it's kind of like this just the the idea of storytelling is more what i'm interested in less than specifically like filmmaking because writing stories has been fun for me as well. I only really started yeah. doing it a couple of years ago, but I found it kind of freeing in the sense that, you know, there are no limitations. Your only limitations are your imagination sure. and whatever it's you like, can It's do. like a campfire sort of thing, isn't it? Like four people sitting yeah. around a campfire and they're telling stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That was actually one of the ways that we um, almost like, uh, you know, tested the quality of, 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 our, of our stories or ideas was the campfire vibe it was just like okay try to try to take this idea you know you can make it into a, a long story or a novella but try to take try to refine it down to or distill the most fundamental elements from it 
and try to tell it as if it was a campfire tale. Uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, and, and if it still works in that regard, you know, you have a good story. Uh, like to me, yeah. that's almost, to me, that's almost the equivalent of like the philosophy of taking a song uh, and it's like, okay, if you can, somebody told me this a long time ago, uh, you know, in, in the music circles or whatever, it was just like pretty much any song in the world that you've heard on the radio or any popular song, mm-hmm. um, you could take that song and you could just distill it down to an acoustic guitar and one voice and yeah. it will work. The song will work. Or yeah. you can have an orchestra and you can have six guitars, you can have everything and it's still the song, but it's just like the song, the fundamental core of the song will work mm-hmm. with that, those bare minimum elements. And I think, that's almost the same thing with the stories. It's like, yeah, if you can break it down to just like, imagine you're telling it at a campfire um, to people sitting around you. If if it gets a spook out of somebody or it creates an an atmosphere, you know, you have kind of a good story, but it was like, there's, so yeah, we have a couple ideas that are being developed for ideally, I'd like to shoot something next spring or summer for sure. Um, There was one project called the rift uh, basically about, uh, you know, the very basic setup is that a guy, takes a designer drug with some of his friends and this drug seems to have no uh, effect on his friends but he kind of passes out and he wakes up and then this entity kind of seems to have be leaving him and it's essentially his like his you know his soul or his astral body that's kind of left himself as a result of this drug um but we're still kind of developing the 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 rest of the story where it should go we've had various different drafts of it but nothing that i've been Mm -hmm. happy with so that's sure. still in, that's still in the cards. But then one of the stories, uh, urban primitives, the the most recent one that's been posted on the site, one of my stories, I, I've I've just right since creating that one, I've always liked it. It, it. it seems like this the the concept is strong. The characters are interesting. Uh, it's kind of unique. It's 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 extremely graphic and gory, but like not in a typical way. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's not like, you know, zombies ripping flesh gory or like a murderer or like, you know, even Saw or Hostel or those kinds of movies where, you know, mm-hmm. somebody's putting somebody else through some terrible event or whatever that's causing them all this pain. It's it's, it's all self-inflicted is, is what I'll say. It's basically, you know, like a, a, a cult of body modification enthusiasts who have this philosophy and they take it to extreme places and stuff. And there's this climactic scene at the end, but it's like that idea to me, if I had you know, in a perfect world, if I could just, if I had the budget today, I would develop that one into a film. And so that was just very, very recently, I've been thinking I had the idea of maybe we had the idea of creating a a, a condensed or kind of like a a proof of concept version of that story, um, which, you know, would only basically exist on the, like the exterior of the story. Like it wouldn't feature the main characters in the main, you wouldn't, you wouldn't wouldn't see most of the, the, the cult or the stories in the character would almost be like a side character and and then their journey trying to get into this cult and something that you can do Mm. very modestly, uh, but also enticing enough to, you know, kind of like show the fact that there's more to tell, um, and kind of have some of the, some of the fundamental parts of the story in it. Uh, but it's like, just hinting at what the bigger picture would be. Um, Almost make, like a sort of a pitch video for like a crowdfunder in a way. Yeah, absolutely. So that was exactly it. The thought was maybe if we were to do something like that and make it quality, um, mm-hmm. we could then try to acquire funding for a more higher scale version of that sure. and actually d- develop that story. Uh, and I mean, it's all doable. It's just a matter of like this, You would, there's some locations that might be hard to shoot and you would need a lot of extras. And there's some mm-hmm. serious like, costumes and effects but none of it is outside of the realm of like possibility i mean it all think i think it all really just comes down to 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 budget and um maybe some tenacity and like just hard work and stuff like that and and, and so it's like yeah definitely in the spring or summer we will be shooting something but as far as what it is yet is still a little bit up in the air probably spend some of the winter um planning that and and and, and writing so yeah, sure. there's definitely definitely some plans for next year. And then also as, as far as the stories as well, I mean, there's four on the website right now. Uh, there's another four in the process of being edited um, that are going to be up on the website. And then that's kind of like, yeah, we're just going to keep updating the website with stories as well. Um, and then that's try cool. to maybe create a bit of a compilation of these stories or whatever and put mm-hmm. them all together. And then if we have the resources, pull from those for the films, uh, mm-hmm. or if not, think again in terms of like what we could film or if you know something falls in my lap like an idea for a film that's completely separate from all of that then I would I would explore that as well but yeah it's a little up in the air as far as which project will be next but we uh we have plans to do more for sure I I think you know it's it's 
age-old um, advice, and people have been saying it for years. You know, Bob Dylan used to sort of say it. You know, in terms of when when asked how did he come up with his songs and ideas, and just I would just write, just write, write every day, and just read, read poetry over and over again. And the more you do, the more create, the more it comes out. You know, so it's like it's <clears throat> it's never it's never a bad idea to write. 10 different stories because you know you might have one half really good idea out of 10 10 stories so so i think i mean that that sounds brilliant and i think probably more i i should do the same um i think probably more filmmakers should basically try to write short stories every single week because again the more the more you do it you're going to get better aren't you and you're going to it's going to stimulate ideas of going okay i could put that that and that together yeah yeah it. totally it's like it's like the picasso quote i think it's something like uh inspiration exists but it has to find you working yeah which is kind of like and i've found that to be pretty true because it's like i'll find that sometimes where i'll be like i don't have any ideas or i can't like or, or i'll be dwelling on a story and i'll be like where am i going to take it where am i going to take it and, and then I, I i almost prevent myself from working on it but then as soon as mm -hmm. i literally sit down and i actually just start working on it uh it just happens like the ideas just start happening or whatever the ideas just start to come up as a result of you putting in the effort and working or like mm. going out there and just like making films you know what i mean instead of telling yourself you can't do it it's just like just go out there and make them even if they're shitty it doesn't matter uh yeah. you know you might get something good you might not but the point is you're gonna get inspired doing so you're gonna learn a lot doing so um mm. so i think it's like yeah it's good in that respect too just to stretch the storytelling muscle whether it's um you know, short stories or whether it's films. I, I, I just find personally writing short stories more fun than screenplays. I don't have, I mean, I've written a couple mm. short ones and I've learned my, uh, my lesson, I would say almost, because I had written a screenplay for The Collected, but it was, um, yeah, I don't know, let's say less detailed than it could have been. Mm. And I, I kind of realized, you know, it sounds obvious, but it's just like actually putting it into practice. It's like the importance of having a very well detailed uh, screenplay for everybody not just yourself as mm -hmm. a director but every single person involved because it's like as the director or the writer or creator you know exactly what it is in your head and you have it all in your head but then you're bringing other people into the project and you know it's it's easy it's easy to just start assuming everyone's on the same page as you or whatever yeah. you go, oh I got you know but really at the end of the day it's like they're not and so it's just like to give somebody something physical like that that they can feed off of and, and look at and kind of uh have to get involved with themselves is important so it's just like, I find, uh, cause I like to read. I mean, I love, um, you know, Clive Barker is probably one of my favorites, uh, you know, writer or, or director for that matter, matter Hellraiser, one of my favorite movies, all of his mm -hmm. short stories are fantastic. Stephen King, HP uh, Lovecraft, oh. like, all these guys, I, I really just love their, their short stories, especially. And, and I find that that's a really like, I like short stories because they don't have a lot of filler either. They don't, yeah. you don't get caught in the weeds of like a novel and there's like, you know, sub arcs of characters that barely matter and just like a lot of filler whereas short stories are really like right to the point i find and you yeah. know it's all about it's all about the idea and then just creating a little bit of a human element or a conflict or a story around it and then you just tell it and then you kind of just move on so it's good for coming up with like concepts and ideas um and different things like that so i find in that respect that yeah storytelling is healthy for sure for anybody that wants to do filmmaking or, or screenwriting i mean i've seen it come up because you know now that i'm i'm doing this stuff the algorithm knows it and so they start sending you shit online or whatever whenever you're on instagram or youtube filmmaking classes this and that all that stuff pops up all the time but you do see a lot of uh you know professional filmmakers or whatever big big artists say things like that they're always like oh yeah like a director should be able to screenwrite like that should be pretty pretty much something that you fundamentally understand because it's like yeah at the end of the day that's where everything stems from is that screenplay so it's like to have a really refined and distinct screenplay before anything else before approaching other people trying to you know bring them into the project being really confident about that screenplay is is, is important and a lesson that i've learned so it's like now for this next project before i try to bring in the crew again and start approaching people i'm just going to make sure that we're like really confident with the the screenplay ourselves um before trying to bring people into it i think it'll make the whole process just smoother sure no 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 question because as i said yeah it's um sharing your vision and you know the, the first thing they want to 
see as a script, you know, or screenplay, or at least a, a premise and everything else. And it's like, it's one thing to be in front of someone to pitch it to them and explain it to them, which yeah, some 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 people can do. Um, but yeah, it's um, ultimately they got to be able to kind of go, oh, okay, this is the plan. <laughs> yeah, know? refer um, back, refer refer back to the screenplay and stuff like that. And a lot yeah. of this probably sounds very obvious, but it's just like I never went to film school and, and stuff like that, right? I sure. mean, if you go to film school, you, you're going to learn all this probably in the first year or whatever. The importance I mean, of all these things. I I I I haven't gone to film school and I've not directed anything yet. I've I've attempted to write some screenplays myself um with uh limited uh success i haven't either finished them or i've shown to people and they've kind of gone this is just really bad um but i think <laughs> it's 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 interesting that you know <laughs> a lot a lot of a lot of films being made at the moment you you kind of do go because was was there even a script you know that <laughs> I, th I think there's there's a lot of a lot of big budget films that get green lit or whatever and you just go this this screenplay this script sucks like it's like it doesn't make any sense the characters are two dimensional blah, blah blah so I think I think even as film school is I think there's a lot of people that are, are not getting that lesson you know um, yeah yeah you're right you're definitely right there's a lot of formula I notice and there's a lot of like I just find yeah I don't know I mean I, I try to keep up with modern uh, you know, with like contemporary uh, cinema and all that kind of stuff. I'm not one of these people that's, you know, because I mean, if, if you're talking horror, uh, the, the glory days of the genre was really the 70s and 80s and all that kind of stuff. Most sure. horror people would agree, but it's just like, I, I don't want to get stuck like that. You know what I mean? I mean, there's been stuff in the 90s, there's been stuff in the 2000s, 2010s, there's stuff being made still that stands out. Um, so it's like, I, I try to embrace contemporary cinema and, and what people are doing now. And like, I, I also appreciate the, shift in representation now that you have i don't know like you know black filmmakers making horror movies like jordan mm -hmm. peele guys like that like you know yeah. from that perspective it's not white people including women and and and, and black characters sure. but it's like women creators or black creators that are actually having their own voice in the genre i think that's important i think that's one of the yeah. um sure. more positive changes that has come to the genre lately um but as far as yeah just sheer like original movies or storytelling or like sheer enjoyment of the movies i've been watching it's just like yeah some of them are pretty forgettable or some of them are just yeah they seem to not make a lot of sense or they're they try too hard or there's a lot of formula it's like there's certainly good stuff being made still but it's just like a lot of it a lot of horror that i see it doesn't doesn't do a lot for me sure sure i i know I, I know i know exactly what you mean um but yet <clears throat> it's as popular as ever you know the horror genre you know there are horror festivals up there out there and there, there seems is, to be a lot yeah. of stuff being, being, being made. Um, so you could argue that there's a market for it, but yeah, there's, there's perhaps um, there it's interesting be... how It's interesting how mainstream it's become now. Like, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, the guys like Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers and, mm -hmm. you know, Leatherface and Pinhead and all those guys who are, were, you know, uh, they all had very modest, starts and, and none of them were yeah. created with the intention of making icons or whatever or making yeah. these things nowadays they're like you can't you go in hot topic and they're on mugs and shit you know what i mean like those, yeah those yeah, characters yeah. Are, are are that they've, they've reached that saturation point where they're you know they're long since not scary uh, forget about scary they're actually like our friends or whatever now they're like you know pop culture yeah. icons or whatever so it's absolutely. like absolutely I almost find that's the one thing I almost think in horror it's like you would have you will have to move away from in order to be original or scary is the idea of like you know this character or whatever this monster or this person or whatever that's why I do like the idea of trying to investigate something a little more cosmic uh yeah HP Lovecraft realm or, or or you know just that kind of psychological or cosmic uh I find body horror to be especially recently uh calling out to me because it's just like body horror is the most relatable i think to all people mm -hmm. we all have bodies <laughs> you know what i mean we're all, sure, we, all sure. we all have bodies we're all stuck in these bodies all these bodies get a, a they age they they uh, decay we get sick um you know I, I just things things happen to our bodies that we can't control and we, we are stuck in them and that mm. is to me that's scary like that shit to me is more scary than anything i mean like that's more scary than the potential of a, a masked murderer or whatever like you know yeah. the, the idea of something something uh unknowable or something 
uh, uncontrollable happening to your own body. It, even though you're doing all the right things, let's say, you know what I mean? You're healthy and you seem to take care of yourself and the doctor's telling you, I, I don't know, man, like, we, you know, we're doing tests. Maybe you should go to another doctor. Like getting into that kind of realm of horror is, is very real and tangible. I think, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I think things like that are really effective these days. Yeah. Yeah. The transformation. And um, I mean, you could say that that's probably one of the oldest forms of horror films there is you know it, it, it's it's literally it's the werewolf it's yeah you're being bitten by where and you turn into a werewolf it's it's to some extent vampire it's it's the idea of um yeah so it's something's happening to you and that you out of your control you know whether yeah, you're Cronen transforming Cronenberg, or, Cronenberg was always big in that stuff with like the yeah. fly and all that kind of yeah. stuff he was really big into the body horror and like exploring sure. that kind of realm of like kind of you know within the realm of uh perhaps possible horror like you know you kind of turn up the element of 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 fantastical things like mm -hmm. in the fly or or scanners yeah. or uh even video drone, but it's just like at the end of the day, it's all stuff that's within the human experience to a certain degree, rather yeah. than something that's too too outlandish or whatever, or something that's like, sure. like you know, or something that's too too like uh, simple, like you know, a killer or or, or things like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Find uh, yeah. something that's a little just just trying a little harder to to make the source of the horror something a little bit different. I think is what I mm -hmm. I am interested in trying to explore because sure. I think everything in a certain sense has been done. Like, I mean, the masked killer has been done. Monsters yeah. have been done. Zombies yeah. have been done. It's all been done so much where it's like, you know, it's not scary most of the time anymore. Gore used to impact people. Like I think if you had some gore mm -hmm. in your film back in the day, you know, you, you, you even hear about it. I mean, I'm, I'm 31, so I missed the eighties, unfortunately, but it's just like, mm -hmm. I wish I didn't because it's just like, I really wish I lived through the time where all those movies were coming out and they were like kind of really niche. Uh, and people were going out of their way to look at them. You had the video nasties in the UK there. Yeah. That was like all these banned films that people weren't allowed to watch. And like, you'd watch and be like, holy shit, you have to go and like, you know, try three different uh, video rental stores to maybe find Hellraiser. And when you got it home, yeah. you're just so like taken back by how violent and crazy it is. Whereas now it's like commonplace. Like there is, you know, video it's on every night. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's like you can't, like that stuff to me, it's just like, I don't want to just retread that ground necessarily. Sure. I want to try to create, you know, an atmosphere or something unsettling or spooky uh, in other ways, really. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. And and I applaud you for, for doing that. And I think more people need to to, to follow that route. Um, briefly, before before you go, because uh, I've, I've kept you a long time, um, if people are interested in what you're doing, your, your short stories, what you're going to be doing, because it sounds like, you know, you've got lots of things planned for, for next year, which is will soon be upon us um yeah do you want to just mention your website your social media that sort of thing i will put the links in video as well uh yeah yeah for sure so the website is uh just satansloveboxcom and then uh our youtube channel is uh satan's love box productions um and yeah we don't have an official instagram at the moment i just run things off of my page which uh, my handle is gamma ray um cool. and yeah that's about it those are basically the main sources the website is kind of the umbrella or the housing for all of the different projects mm -hmm. which is where we'll be updating regularly um and then yeah the youtube channel has the films right now we're also in the process of creating um audiobook versions of the short stories oh cool uh, yeah just because i mean i know that I've, I've even personally had friends or people that would like love to read these stories but they're just not much they don't like to read that much or they don't you know it yeah. takes a lot of I, I think it's hard these days for people that aren't big readers to mm -hmm. uh focus on reading even for myself I, I like to read and it's hard for me sometimes to just yeah. focus in on you know we have so much going on I like to read on my phone uh so it's like it's even harder now because you got notifications coming up on your phone when you're trying to read and whatnot yeah yeah so um, yeah the thought process was just having an audiobook version of these stories would make them more uh consumable for people that were maybe interested and would rather listen to an hour audiobook than sit down for hours on end reading a story yeah, that makes perfect sense i mean i you know i i am a big fan of audiobooks <clears throat> myself i go for walks go to the gym whatever and i listen listen to stuff i'm just out of interest how would you what platform would you sell that on would you sell it on your own website or would you um try to go on amazon's one yeah, i'm personally not a big fan of amazon <clears throat> but um yeah just ha ha oh, i don't know if you've even got that far yet but 
have you thought about how you would yeah basically just putting them out there like i mean there wasn't really much thought about selling them they were more so just going to be uh like an included feature on the story on the website like i yeah. mean if each, each story has its own little section and then at the top uh there's an option to download the pdf and then mm. the story itself is is on the website um sure. so then I, I was just thinking of including that kind of with each story right at the top there's just like a, a little you know whatever bar that plays the, yeah. the audiobook um That'd be cool. and then on the and then, yeah, and then on our YouTube channel as well, um, just having them there with, you know, some kind of graphic, basic graphic or whatever. Um, and then just having them there to click on. So it's like, yeah, because at the end of the day, I, I just want people to to see them or hear them or read them. Because yeah. uh, that's what gives these things life at the end of the day. I mean, without that, they're just, you know, words on, on, on a, pa- a piece of paper or whatever. It's, it's only a real thing when somebody's reading it or listening to it. And yeah, that story is unfolding in their brain and, and it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's actually happening. So that to me is more important at this point than, than trying to make any money off of them. So sure. yeah, anywhere we can, anywhere we can really, we're just going to try to put them out there. I, I personally am not all that unfamiliar. I'm not all that familiar with audio books. I don't actually listen to them myself a lot, mm-hmm. but it's like, I know that there are places that you can, you know, put them as well that are specifically for that audio Lee or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's places like that that I was thinking of investigating, but yeah, for the most part, the website is where it'll all be housed, trying to keep everything uh, in-house. I think that's a good idea. And you could always put a sort of like a, a digital tip jar that if someone totally. thought it was really good, they could they could give you like a, a dollar or two. Um, and I yeah, think that's a good idea. Most, people, most people probably would, you know, if it is free and they're like, I like this and download the other five or six, you know, I, I, I certainly would uh, donate because, you know, why not? Because, you know, you... you put put your effort and, and time in to, to do it um no I, I look forward to doing that and i will check the uh, website because i'd like to um read some of the short stories because i've not actually I, I have visited your site but i've not looked at the uh, short stories so i need to do that um i just want to thank you for for speaking uh with me today um and yeah i look forward to what your next uh, project will be. Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time and chatting with me and having the interest and uh, yeah, for doing what you're doing and supporting indie. That's definitely great to have people that are out there doing that stuff. So uh, I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. And I will continue um, promoting uh, The Collected Kids. It really is a, is a fantastic uh, short film. I really enjoyed it and everyone wow, needs to, uh, to see it. So um, yeah, Raymond, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, man.